The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, IT Asset Management for the Service Desk. I'm joined by Rory Canavan from Sam Charter and Phil Merson from Avanti. Uh, are you guys on the line? We are indeed. Hello Scarlett. Hello. Uh, just a quick thank you to Avanti for being the sponsor of today's webinar. Um, so I will leave you in the capable hands of Rory and Phil. Thank you very much, Scarlett. Um, Rory. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, if you're, uh, if you're UK based, any UK based. Good morning, if you're elsewhere around the world, or good evening, even. Um, my name is Rory Canavan. I'm the founder and owner of SAM Charter, and we um, drive SAM and ITAM from a process perspective. Hi, my name is Phil Merson. I'm a director and ITAM specialist for Avanti. Uh, my background goes back some 20 years around IT asset management um, and uh, I've seen a lot of change and growth in the marketplace and today we're going to have a look at a little bit more detail around process and some tooling as well as we walk through this, this uh, webinar. Um, but to start with, I just wanted to look at what actually asset management really means to us all now. Uh, because IT asset management is is now a buzzword. I mean, it's 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 really flying now, Rory, isn't it? It's uh, it's something which people are really getting to grips with. The knowledge and the uh, the investment that people are making in ITAM is very rewarding. But the set of practices, as it says on this slide, allows organisations to actually engage the right way around software asset management. Because we see a lot of failures in our market, don't we? To uh, uh, belittle the, the concept of uh, compliance, but um, I think we need to move away from that necessarily and focus on starting value from the investment that we make in technology. So that's it, absolutely what we're trying to achieve in this deck to get today. And it's not just about ITAM as part of Service Desk, it's ITAM as part of your IT culture and your IT investment across your whole organization. And you'll see a little bit about that as we move through because. It does impact a lot on an organization. Um, there are a lot of big whys. Uh, why do we actually need to invest in software and hardware asset management? Um, I mean, that big one there, software audit, that frightens the living daylights out of a lot of our customers. Um, making sure that they can engage in a software audit from a position of strength. But you can't do that unless you can actually identify all your software and, and hardware assets, obviously. Um, and there's another one there, GDPR. GDPR is quite frightening nowadays, um, but I think people sometimes misread what GDPR is all about, especially as part of ITAM. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's one aspect we've had to look at from our, our own um, maturity assessment. And, and um, it essentially, it's just looking after personal data. If, you, if you've got a, the concept of information security in your own organization, then looking after data is, is a recognized and understood concept. You're just going one step further. So there's your dartboard, information security is your dartboard, potentially your bullseye then is personal data. So the steps that you take to look after information security should be wound down and, and focused on where personal data actually comes in. So you spot your points of ingress and egress, which systems are actually looking after personal data and, and manage accordingly them. Yeah, I think it's something which is you know massive growth and it's obviously come into our uh, EU marketplace quite, with, with some um, strength, but uh, obviously this is a global global issue. And, you know, managing it is very important, as is uh, managing the you know your hardware that comes in and out of the organisation. We're going to touch on that as well today, obviously, which is important. Um, all the, the the life cycle refreshes for software and hardware, um, and also we're going to touch on security as well because they're inextricably linked, as we'll see in a minute. So let, let's carry on. Let's just have a look at some of the key pain points that uh, uh, we, we've raised in this deck, which uh, can give you a little bit of a heads up on, on where we should be starting. But ultimately, we, we can't manage what we can't see or we can't manage what we don't know we have. So it's very important to actually start discovering all our assets and keeping them in some kind of repository, which we can manage going forward, whether it be increasing or decreasing um, that, that asset register. Um, but we need to be able to track them all the way through the time they start or the time even a re request is made all the way through to the time it leaves the organization, whether that be hardware or software. If, you, if you're if you disposing of hardware, you're releasing software. And we'll talk about that as well in a, in a few minutes time. 
uh, but also being able to manage software audits b b before they become an issue. I mean, th this is just part of the course now. All around the world, uh, the large vendors, uh, don't need to mention them, are engaging in, perhaps they don't call them audits anymore, but they're certainly reviews. Mm -hmm. I mean, underlying, Rory, that is an audit, isn't it? Yeah. It's just a part of um, other going their discovery processes, their understanding of um, what you have in place because you can you can make purchases completely around software um, and it can be deployed multiple times over. So the comparison of purchases to deployment needs to be uh, managed. You need to know what you've deployed compared to what you've purchased. Yeah, I completely endorse that. But by being able to do that, you've then got the information to be able to control and optimize your your spend and your usage. Um, because it's quite easy to be over compliant. Uh, yeah. In fact, you know, we, we see quite often, and there are actually reports from analysts that state that uh, most organizations are actually over compliant rather than under compliant. And I feel that's actually a worse scenario to be in because you spend the money. You can't reclaim it, can you? And, and there is that thing of being incremental. You're fine. You're going to be doing the right thing. And it's fine that you go through that audit and then you've tripped over a term and condition and you've you're, you're, you're in double jeopardy then at that point. So you've, you've breached the term and condition of license which means you have to buy again for the existing installation and then you go for on stuff that you think is going to be actually moving forward. And it's possibly the wrong version of edition release. It, it's not going to be any use. Exactly. Rory, so sorry. Being able to... Yes. Sorry, Rory, we're struggling to hear you a bit. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll get a little closer to the mic and see how we get on there. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so okay, so we, we, we're controlling that spend, but we also need to be able to reduce any risk within the business because ultimately the CXO level are trying to make sure that risk within their organization is reduced as much as possible. And that comes in a multitude of different fashions. Around ITAM, it's being able to obviously know what you have, which means that uh, your risk of things disappearing that you don't know about is reduced. But also the risk around uh, non-compliance or, or audit means that you're potentially reducing your reputational and financial risk. So all that uh, security and reputational and financial risk is managed within ITAM. So this gives the clarity of everything that you have within your business, which is the best place you can possibly be. But the biggest question really is, where on earth do we start? Rory. Thank you. Uh, Phil, so um, first and foremost, if you're going to start uh, any sort of ITAM program, you need uh, the best pro programs that I've ever seen start and take a top-down approach. If you, if you start from the operational bottom level up, um, every, every step of maturity is uh, an assault course that you have to um, overcome and win. So um, if you take a top-down approach, we can start to um, identify the risks in the business. What risks are we seeking to address? And Phil touched on some of those already. It could be compliance, it could be uh, financial risk. Uh, and what business goals are we seeking to achieve? Well, if, you, if you're plugged into service management, you understand the concept of setting up IT services. You should be setting up your IT services to address those business goals. Um, next, you might then have IT goals that you wish to address, and it could be you might even argue that compliance is an IT goal that you want to ensure that you, you achieve or value for money. Um, and then what are your SAM goals? Well, control. So I, I would argue control of, of IT assets would be a SAM goal. So you're, you're maximizing the use of those assets to, to an appropriate level. Um, then we have aspects around legislation do we have to adhere to. So we've, we've touched on GDPR um, in the UK and indeed in the EU. Um, that we have to um, comply with. And if your business is in any uh, particular sector, are there regulations to concern yourself with? So as an example there, we've got COSH, um, which for organizations that deal in um, uh, hazardous chemicals, as it says there, typically if you take an employee on, you've, you've, your data protection regulations within the UK state that you, have to, you can keep um, records of those individuals up to two years. Um, but if you're dealing in um, hazardous chemicals, you're supposed to keep them indefinitely. 
because if that individual then leaves and then comes back in six years time and attempts to claim that working with hazardous chemicals somehow impacted their life uh, and they want to sue the company you have to keep a record of their engagement with those hazardous chemicals now how does that affect sam well you've got version controls around the databases you might actually keep that data in so that you have to start think, thinking slightly outside the box as to how you're managing data how you're then managing the software and what impact that actually has as well. Yeah, yeah, um, you could, you, arguably you could spin that regulation back up to a business goal then. So it's the effective management of risk and the effective management of data in your organization. It's, it's amazing how the weave crosses, it is, it's just, Yeah, absolutely, and finance as well. So, I mean, I think there was an example of a certain building society here in the UK some years ago, uh, an unencrypted laptop with all the customer databases went missing. There was 2.1 million records that went, you know, out into the ether. Um, and I think the Financial Conduct Authority or its equivalent at the time fined the organisation over two million pounds for, for one laptop that went missing. Um, just on, on the, the final bullet point on the slide, one thing we look to do, and, and this, this again plays the best practice with regards to, um, shall we say, the recent revision to ISO 19770, which is the, the IT asset management uh, process standard. Um, and that's to qualify your scope. So if, you've, uh, if you're going to set up any sort of ITAM program, you need to have a boundary. You need to understand what it is you're looking after. And, and that boundary can't just be everything in IT from the get-go anyway. You, you have to stagger your approach. You, ha you have to reach out, work small and, and then grow and find out what works well for you. And that boundary could be geographic as well as vendor-based. So you could start with one particular vendor and then work wider, or it could be one particular country and then you work wider. But find out what works well for you and then expand accordingly. Yeah. Sorry, Phil, can you come a bit closer to the mic, please? Yep, it, it's funny that because we're both as close as each other. <laughs> we're, we're, we're nearly touching. Um, but yeah, qualifying the scope is, is absolutely paramount. But obviously, there are sort of easier ways of engaging on this and, and practices and processes that we can implement. Um, can you show the, the audience today some of those processes that we could actually adopt um, in, in especially ITAM and SAM? Yeah, sure. So we, we have a series of, um, of processes that we um, we actually um, promote online by the, the you see there the, the SAM Charter URL. And what we have here is a, an ARIS, A-R-I-S model of how to actually conduct a corporate governance process. So just to give you a bit of a, a, a walkthrough on the grammar of the shapes, you'll see the squashed hexagon on the left hand side there. That's that's representative of the trigger. The next shape along is the, the blue um, oblong there. That is, that is a, uh, an activity. And then the um, shapes going into that blue um, oblong there, there, that's data. That's data going into that function step. And then on the right hand side, we have data coming out. And any um, individuals or stakeholders or departments that are involved in that step, um, are highlighted in a yellow box to the right hand side and if we call on any systems or applications to conduct that they would be on the left hand side it's just in this particular example we don't have them. so 1.10 we conduct that risk analysis and we base it on risk analysis criteria we might actually have run through uh, an ITAM maturity assessment as well to understand what we have in place already in regards to management of IT assets I'll come back to the proposed amendments to the ITAM policy because this is circular and we'll see that as we go on to page C. Off the back of that then we've identified that we've got a risk analysis report there. These, these are the points that we want to address with any ITAM program that we implement. At 1.20 the board actually reviews that risk analysis report because these things aren't done on the fly and they don't, they're not an overnight activity. It could be an organization goes through this, it takes six, eight, 12 months to actually generate that risk analysis report. And in that intervening period, the business could have gone in a different direction and inherited potentially new risks. So if, 
if that is the case, we can step up to 1.30 and rework the risk analysis until such time as we go around and actually get um, risk analysis approval then at that point. So we go to page B then at that point. From page B then at 1.40, we take the risk analysis report and the maturity assessment and we actually create an ITAM policy. So we, we jigsaw, if you like, against the risks. And again, we, we do the same again. We, we go to the board and we say, this is the plan that we wish to implement to address the risks that have been highlighted. Again, if the board feels that it's not appropriate or it hasn't um, addressed all the points that are of major concern to it, then we can go for a reworking activity at 1.60. But we can keep going around until such time as the board is happy and feels that we've got a policy in place that we can take forward. Finally, then, we've got a policy that we can actually promote and the ITAM champion reaches out to the comms department and also potentially to the HR department to find out the scope of who actually needs to see the policy. And what we can, where we hand off, we've got a new shape here in the top right hand corner that demonstrates how the process actually feeds into another process. And that is to create uh, an IT and maintain an ITAM plan. So your policy should, in theory, be a three to four page document max, depending on the size and scope of your organisation. And then your, your plan, if you like, that can be war and peace. That can be absolutely massive. It, it depends on the size of your organisation, but um, the size and scale doesn't put people off reading the document then, whereas your policy document shouldn't be too large, otherwise people don't read it. Um, we've got a review process as well. So we go back periodically and um, nothing... That the favorite phase of mine, I like to say, is that change is the enemy. You know, if your IT department was static and you've got a low, low turnover of change and the business doesn't really change, then the plan and policy that you create can last you two, three, four, five years. But in reality, a lot of organizations are moving in different directions. They're buying other organizations. They're taking on new tech. Um, and accordingly, that needs factoring into any ITAM policy. So we go through the exercise again and we go back to page A through that activity. Um, that's, that's absolutely uh, vital there. So we, we've got a strategic approach to what it is we're doing from the top level. And I'll be quite honest with you, you know, so the, these pages of uh, workflow that you, you've built here, obviously you're, you're guiding your customers through that workflow and helping them because each customer is different in the way they, maybe the policy might be very similar, but the way they actually set up a process mm -hmm. to actually review a process and go full circle is actually quite unique to each business. Yeah, yeah, and equally you could find that um, some organisations will want to put extra steps and loops in there to, to suit their own unique requirements. Uh, that there is, this is a, a draft, it is a template, uh, and that's one of the biggest paragraphs I have in the, in the process kit online, is that we say, customise these, do not take these off the shelf and think that it's feet up job done you, you absolutely need to customize this for your own organization i think that's pretty imperative you know the, the old analogy of people process tools is is really important because people need to be involved but processes are so important we see so many times that people start with tools without a process and that's where we see a lot of failure um, but obviously there are some tips that you can give the, the audience today about how we actually start Mm. Uh, and sort of roll this out. So what are the top tips, Rory? Well, really, um, strategically, make sure um, that you have a corporate governance process in place so that any ITAM initiatives that start at an operational level are fully supported by senior management. What you don't want to do is um, purely get um, systems or tools in place, install them, because if, if you just do that, what you'll find is that your ITAM function is going to be report only. You, you could create works of art that are absolutely brilliant that, that surgically analyze where you are with your IT and IT assets. But if senior management aren't plugged into those reports, either for information or for action, nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to improve. And when it comes to that point of a contract negotiation, a vendor audit, a true up, you're going to find yourselves looking at, at, at appalling positions and saying, we shouldn't let that happen again in the future. And you'll be on a constant loop of, of bad practice. So from a governance point of view, absolutely have that process in place, so senior management plug in. From an operational point of view, have a recycling process, both hardware and software. Um, 
one of the worst things that you can actually do is wait for an ELP report to be produced. Well, sorry, quickly, what's, oh, an, what's an ELP? ELP is effective license position. Thank you. Sorry, yes, a license compliance report. Um, don't wait for the production of that report before you start to remove IT assets. Um, and, and we've got some reasons uh, coming up on the next slide now as to why that is the case. Yeah, I mean, recycling is very important, you know, and we need to know why recycling is important. So you've mentioned another number of factors there. So yeah, let's just have a look at what, what the reasons really are. Okay, well, from a software point of view then as well, it, it potentially reduces your patching and version control overhead. If, you, if you've got redundant software that's, that's aging, all of a sudden you might be thinking that you're two or three versions behind or your numerous patches behind, and that's just going to add to the list of software that you need to potentially update. Um, from an information security point of view, you have software that can um, permit access and exit of data in and out of your IT systems. And I knew of a, a, a particular university in London where a network manager who retired had left himself a back door onto the IT estate just so he could periodically have a look in and see what was going on. Um, so not only was that a breach of possibly his infosec protocols and access controls, but being able to identify the software that grants the access in the first place is, um, is absolutely vital. So if you're going through that recycling activity of shutting down non-new software, you're, you're reducing that risk. Um, it reduces your ITAM scope as well. So the level of management that's being applied to these IT assets is shrunk um, because you are going through that, um, uh, that recycling and that, and that taking off of activity. Uh, and as a consequence, if you do have stuff that's not being used, be it software or hardware, it can restock your hardware and license pool. So that, that acts as a cost avoidance activity in the future. So when future requests come in, for new hardware or, or new software, you, you've got a ready stock of IT assets that you can tap into to address those. Um, and through this recycling, what you may be also be able to drive at then is a kind of a rationalization exercise as well. So do you realistically need 20 versions of a PDF reader on your IT estate, or can you get away with three or four? Um, or do you need numerous iterations of say, Microsoft Office on your, on your IT estate, and if so, can you consolidate that to, to drive a better, uh, a better deal for making a larger purchase with a software vendor then? Also, that optimization of all those different tools, so different PDFs, different Office versions, et cetera, um, IT team's got to support that through its life. So if you're yeah. supporting multiple different versions and additions potentially, um, that, that creates not only extra work, but potentially it can create non-compliance as well from a software asset management perspective. Uh, it's because you just got more to manage and that just becomes harder to do it. Uh, but also you, you touched on security vulnerabilities and you know that we hear so many stories about people leaving organizations and a year later coming back to the organization and being uh, productive the first day they get back. Well, that's because they were never offboarded and they still got all their old passwords. And they can just log in and keep going. I mean, and we hear stories about this all the time. And we'll, we'll touch on security in, in a minute a little bit more because we do see these um, these disciplines of ITAM and security very closely related. But, you know, we, we're talking about a lot of different data that we're having to play with here. Um, and the sort of data sources that we have to work with are insurmountable. And I think a, a lot of people don't realize quite how much we have to deal with around ITAM. Uh, things like those data sources, we've got different applications, uh, and then it gets even more complex when you try and do software asset management with virtualization, and there's clustering now on top of that. That's even complicated it more. Uh, then you've got business-specific uh, uh, tools, and you've got all the different vendor information as well. I mean, that's not even limited by what we've got on the screen there, is it? No, no, indeed, because I think uh, the, um, the classic case that came to light in the last 12 months was um, with, with Diageo. Uh, and, and SAP and indirect usage and, and taking your Salesforce database and plugging it into SAP. It's not a case of merely paying for the bridge, it's paying for the people who cross the bridge between the connections as well. So uh, whilst something may be technically achievable in regards to actually um, delivering a, a new means of doing business, you've always got to sort of check back and make sure that um, contracts and licenses actually permit that, that technological achievement that you say is achievable. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, insurmountable data sources. And don't, 
can be sort of phased by this as uh, as, as organizations. You, you will know a lot of this information already, but being able to wrap your arms around it is very important because ultimately there are some significant savings that can be made. Uh, I mean, that first one, 30% reduction in software spend with SAM processes yes. and tools. A lot of people just say, oh, with SAM tools, but no, processes actually drive um, savings for yes. themselves. That Sam is purely there for the audit, for the true, for the contract negotiation, but just leads your IT estate to fester, uh, and it's it's not the way forward. It's not the way Sam should be done. You should you should be sort of monitoring on a weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis. Yeah, and you know the, the other savings or opportunities on here are quite significant. You know, 25% on software spend or managing your software can 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 make cost savings, but also managing vendors can reduce by up to 50%. I mean, these are significant amounts of money. Are they, are they realistic? Are they true? Absolutely, yeah. Because again, if you think of a lot of the deals that, that take place in a lot of organizations, in many multinational organizations, a lot of them take place on the golf course. So the sense of due diligence that takes place, you know, on hole six, par five, is it just doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. And these things, if you have a look at a software contract, they're, they're X number of pages long. It's font four, and the T's and C's are not something that you just want to go, yeah, great, okay, let's just sign an alliance away, yeah. A lot of organizations sort of do look at these savings and go, yeah, right, they, they, they can't be realistic. But, uh, you know, my 20 years of engaging in software and IT hardware asset management, those savings are real. Uh, and you'll be quite surprised. Some, of the, some are tangible, so you can make an immediate cash saving. Some are non-tangible, which potentially are a, a reduction in risk. But a, a risk could become a tangible saving as soon as an audit start, starts taking place because you're, you're moving from something which is a, a perhaps you'll have to pay it to suddenly, oh, we do have to pay it. So it's a reality. Um, but in effect, those savings are real. But, all, but also we talked about security earlier and there are, there are certain integration points with the, the Center for Internet Security and these CSC controls. Uh, in fact, those top two are so that you can't do security without those top two. And that, that's identifying your, your physical devices and all your software. Uh, so you can't really un undertake proper security management if you don't know where all your hardware and software is. Seems a bit basic, but it's true. community out there with the practitioners of ISO 27001, I think we were talking about this before. Um, one of your mandatory requirements to maintain an information security management system is that you protect your data from a delivery up point of view, i.e. you, you prevent um, the, the prospect of a software vendor coming in and actually asking for the software back uh, based on, okay, it's, it's, that's their nuclear option, um, if they feel that you've not paid for the software or it doesn't look like you're going to pay for it. So, um, if you have information security and you have that certification, you really should be practicing ICANN to make sure that your certificate is actually worth the paper it's printed on. Yeah, that's brilliant. So we, we've gone around a lot of the, the, the reasons why and how to start up a, an ICANN process. What we're going to dip into now is to actually look at Avanti's uh, portfolio of uh, products for, for ICANN. So, those portfolio, that portfolio is quite small. Um, it deals with hardware and software. Uh, and the, the two products really are license optimizer for clients and server, which is on the right hand side of the screen, which deals with the software. And on the left hand side of the screen, we've got asset manager, which deals with the hardware. Um, now, these, these are you know, tools which have been in existence for some time. Uh, the software side for over 10 years have been in the marketplace. And hardware asset management's been there for years and years and years. Um, there's a new release of Asset Manager, which has just come out, which is, is actually adhering to the 14 disciplines of the IA ITAM framework for, for IT asset management. So very, very closely linked. So out of the box, you can manage the full life cycle of your assets. Now, hardware and assets obviously are, are very, very closely linked. And both of those products um, link a lot of the information together. So software asset management is obviously dealing with the, the software side, producing a license position, which you can use as part of a, a software audit with people like Microsoft, Adobe, Oracle, IBM, et cetera. 
both on the client and the server. And the reason we have client and server as two separate products is because they are basically very much different to manage. And we'll come on to that in a little bit in, in a second. On the hardware side, the, the tracking of a life cycle of an asset from cradle to grave, um, we find is getting more and more important, including tracking all the warranties um, and all the service management of all those assets, but also tracking all the financial elements of those assets. So within the asset manager uh, products that Avanti have produced, we can track that down to a cost of ownership. So we can actually do a showback and, and uh, uh, a chargeback for a device, even the software on that device, back to different departments within the organization, which means you can actually track it really, really tightly and therefore optimize your, your hardware assets. So let's have a little bit more of a detail look into License Optimizer. Uh, this is a software asset management tool, or some people call them license asset, asset management tools. And there are others on the market and they, in effect, do the same thing. They're, they're taking data from discovery tools. Uh, like CCM and Avanti have their own discovery tools. Um, and they're taking your licenses and entitlements and your contracts, merging the two together to give you a license position and output. But nowadays that's more complicated. It's not just what you can find through discovery. You've also got SaaS-based solutions and user-based solutions. So it can't be just what the device is holding from a software perspective. It is what you or are using, either through a SaaS portal or, or potentially as a, as a user for a, a product on a device. So it's not licensed by the device, it's licensed by the person. MSDN licensing, for example, with Microsoft. Um, but being able to get clarity on that from a single source of truth is really important because then you can, and there's a lot of wood and there's a lot of trees in, it, in the picture. And you, if you can sort the, the gaps out, you can actually see much, much more clearly where your potential liabilities are. So you can actually reduce that risk that we talked about earlier. Um, so license optimized for client and server is very, very much about managing your, your software for clients and servers. Asset manager, as I mentioned earlier, complete visibility on where your assets are, who's using them, how they're being used, and a full cost management on the value of those assets within your organization. So complete end-to-end -end tracking from cradle to grave uh, with great reporting so you can actually uh, deliver reports to different parts of the organization to actually show them how they're actually using those, those assets within, within the business. Now, as I mentioned, they're inextricably linked, but this, this webinar is all about linking this with Service Desk as well. And Asset Manager, in fact, Evanti's Asset Manager is actually built on the same um, code base and same database as Service Manager. So the full Service Manager platform now has Asset Manager and the, and the disciplines of managing your assets on the same platform. They, they're not just inextricably linked, it's the same product. You know, it's, it's the same thing, which means that you don't have to dive from one product to another to manage those assets. It's all there, all manageable within the screen by the same user if you want to want, want the same user to manage it. But again, for service management perspective, request management, product catalogs, software catalogs, and all the disciplines around problem instant change is actually using the same information as asset management does today. So not only inextricably linked, they are actually part of the same family moving forward. So we see this coming closer and closer and closer together. And it doesn't matter whether they, they are two different products potentially, uh, because a lot of these tools actually integrate together through things like APIs or even automation uh, workflow processes that we have again within Avanti ourselves. So we could link our asset manager database into uh, other databases or service management tools like ServiceNow or Hornbill or Churl, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can still utilize that same information from a single source of truth. So that's just a little bit of an introduction to Avanti's ITAM portfolio. Um, but it, it, as I say, it does go wider than just ITAM. Um, but when we are actually talking about uh, maturity, um, everybody's heard about maturity models across not just ITAM, but service management, identity management, endpoint management, security management, they're all, they're all there. But each one of them, excuse me, each one of them has a maturity model. And in, in, in the perspective of, of maturity for ITAM, it can be quite daunting. You know, what we've got on the screen here is a, a, lot, a, a lot of content. And not, I don't want to go through this in, in detail, but we obviously have a level one to five, which is a typical maturity level. 
Um, but quite often we see organizations pitching themselves, probably before even starting, slightly higher than they actually are mm -hmm. from a maturity perspective for ITAM. Is, is that your experience as well? Made in any sort of product um, and once you've got a product in place, well, that's it, what's the problem? You know, it, it's a bit like me owning a cooker, you know, that doesn't make me go on the round. You've, you've got to know what you're actually doing with the product, so you've got, you've got to have that instruction set that sits around uh, your technology and interfaces with the rest of the business. And typically, the way to do that is, is through the process. I like the, the analogy, uh, the, the recipe book, the, the, the cookbook. <laughs> exactly. I like that, yeah. So obviously the, the last column on this uh, maturity model is the outcomes. Um, and eventually what we, what we do is actually map those outcomes to the portfolio that we've actually got. Now you'll notice that level one doesn't have any tool. Now that's because you have to start by investing in your processes and, and, and understanding where you're starting from. There's no point going and implementing a tool um, when you don't know what it's going to deliver for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this is why we, you know, I, I could have picked from, from multiple processes to, um, uh, to demonstrate the, the average workflows that we do at Sound Charter um, at the beginning of the presentation. But the reason I, I was so keen to use the governance process is because you're, what you're going to do is, is talk Sam or ITAM in a business context. If you don't do that, you're very quickly going to lose people when you start talking about UVUs, cores, CPUs, um, named user plus licenses. The, the terminology and acronyms in and around Samaritan are going to switch people off if they're not in that space already. So it's absolutely vital you speak in the business language. I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you there. I mean, ITAM and, and the acronyms in ITAM are, are sometimes mind boggling. A bit like an ELP that we talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An, yeah. an effective license position. Who would that presentation? Oh, I, I don't know. It's shocking. Um, but it is important to realise that you know your CXOs are expecting delivery of uh, of software and hardware asset management, and to, to do it right is an imperative. And the number that we've seen fail in the past, where we're, we're working with organisations. Um, that say, you know, this is our second, may even be the, our third attempt at getting this right. And it's usually because the the tool was purchased to tick the box, yeah. and yet there was nothing to support the process of actually using that tool. But but ultimately, Rory, in, in Sam Charter, you, you're designing far more than just the onboarding process. It's, uh, there's a lot more than that. It's all about managing the output or, and process output and managing KPIs and delivery of what you're actually doing through the ITAM process. So explain to us a little bit more about your, your, your asset, your, your, your process design. Sure, so firstly I'd have to offer my apologies to those who are looking on the, the WebEx. This is, um, um, the, the text on it is absolutely tiny, I appreciate that. So it's probably better off if you, if you scurry away to the URL there and, and download a copy to print for yourself. You can blow this up to A1 size. Uh, and, um, and spread it across a clear desk and you can actually see what we're, we're seeking to achieve here. Um, but if I can grab the, uh, the cursor here, will it, will it allow me to, uh, oh, there we go, fantastic. So um, earlier you talk, saw me talk through the corporate governance process uh, and that's, that's represented here in this little shape. And, and then we, we touched on the fact that we pass out to a create and maintain a SAM plan process. Um, so really we, we've sought to, tackle the strategic up here and then we can feed on um, and, and then we can start to uh, support, uh, create a supported software catalogue. So this is where we set our scope. This is how we would actually say to an organisation, what falls into your definition of IT assets and provide a list accordingly. And now that list can change over time. You know, um, I, I saw um, a post from Patricia Adams, I think it was, uh, on LinkedIn, um, she, she made reference to the Internet of Things and for a healthcare company, would Fitbits be considered IT assets? Um, it's right now, I mean, my, my personal opinion was no, not yet, but I'd want to see the business case to justify that and maybe in a health organisation that would be absolutely appropriate. 
I, I'm not so sure in an office organization. I don't know whether my boss would really want to know my heart rate. But um, from, you know, who's to say that's going to change in, in, in the mid to long term? Because it could be if your company is offering um, health benefits, um, you know, gym membership, um, they want to make sure you're staying fit and healthy. You're actually using that gym membership. And therefore, why wouldn't a Fitbit actually give you that sort of, you know, pseudo data? Um, so defining what those IT assets are, be they software, be they hardware, is, is absolutely vital. But what we seek to do as well is to, you can see there are multiple processes here, is to actually um, uh, look at the, um, the life cycle. So we can, I think we've got here a, a software removal process, we've got a request process, we've got a hardware disposal process in here as well. So if we, what you'll find is you'll have hardware processes that can impact software and vice versa as well. So if you say, for example, get to the point where you get to a software removal process and you remove the last bit of software off a hardware device, well, you can re, you know, redeploy that or you can actually dispose of that hardware asset then at that point. So there's an obvious uh, different color and the triangle in the middle, the Bermuda Triangle of Sand. Explain, explain to the audience what that is. Yeah, so this is a particular um, three, uh, three milking or three legged milking stool that I like to uh, bang on about um, in, in an organization. And um, this is the, the inter process relationship between the software request process, the procurement process, and the change management or deployment process, depending on, on your terminology of use. Um, if you haven't got these processes set up and talking, well and talking properly between each other what you're going to find is that you're setting yourself up for the perfect storm of a vendor audit hence the Bermuda Triangle so you, sh you should be following from a best practice point of view or a good practice point of view I would argue uh, line management approval IT approval at the request process uh, level uh, and also conducting a license pool check to make sure that you don't rubber stamp requests coming through for software then at that point uh, from procurement point of view, you want to make sure that any requests for software are coming through an authorised channel, so people aren't leaving post-it notes or emails or nods and winks from a, the corner of the desk to say, please, can you buy that software for us? Uh, and you may have your own sense of due diligence that you want to deploy from a procurement process as to um, do you go to an invitation to tender process? Um, do we go through a sanity check to make sure that the vendor that we're dealing with is actually actually on an approved list uh, have we got sort of um, uh, higher GRC requirements to make sure that the organizations aren't engaged in uh, um, I, I was one of them I saw was, was slavery believe it or not in a particular client we want I, I, I highly unlikely in a software vendor scenario but it's reputational damage that you're looking to limit there from a purchase point of view um, and finally of course you've got your change management so you want to close this loop that, again, best practice, if you're, if you're deploying to a piece of software to 2,000 um, hardware platforms, you want to make sure it's to the right 2,000 and, and to make sure that you've got some sort of a rollback plan in place and also that you do a sanity check around the license so that what's requested is what was purchased and what was purchased is what's deployed. And, and the shake-up or the, the, the distinction um, between those three, um, if they're not quite right, will be absolutely... Um, uh, could be calamitous for you and we see that too often is that you know if a request comes in we follow white till best practice strangely if, if they take that request and it gets split between the two and we worry about marrying up the data at a later stage so a lot of information that you you just imparted to the audience Rory there mm. uh, you know when, when you look at something like this and, and listen it, it sounds very complicated to the general organization yeah but actually it's not. It, it's something that most organizations are already doing to a certain extent, but prob probably not documenting or realizing they're doing elements of it. So a lot of these are trigger points that you can actually embed into an existing process or, or extend from an existing process, because most customers already have a request mechanism, mm. but are they including the sign-off from uh, somebody who knows how many software uh, licenses we've actually got? So a lot of it is it, it's not as frightening as you think audience I promise you it's it's actually much much uh, easier if you get the right advice uh, and take the right steps in, in implementing it now obviously the, there is a sign of maturity a true sign of maturity Rory. Oh, what what's in your eye 
in your mind? What are those? So when we when we conduct our um, assessments through through Sam Carter, um, we we grade um, from not practiced or not documented right through to practiced, documented, reviewed, and aligned to ITL business strategy. Now, if you're reporting to senior management, senior management aren't going to want to see um, CSV outputs or uh, PDFs of CSV outputs from your product set. What they're going to have a look at uh, and be happy with are KPIs. So you should be looking to put um, meaningful KPIs, and I stress the word meaningful there, I should have italicized that and put it in bold there on the screen, um, that support the business and IT goals that kicked off your ITAM program in the first place. So you've got the link between operation and action to strategy and direction that the business actually wants to move in at that point. What those KPIs are is, is a judgment call. It depends on what your organization is actually seeking to achieve. So it's not a kind of a let's, let's read the back of a book and see what the answers are. It's a case of actually engaging with senior management and seeing what demonstrates value to them. Um, the, the final line there I put on there, um, not the red or black figure at the bottom of a compliance report. A compliance report gener is generated to the benefit of a software vendor. You can't look at that red or black figure at the bottom of a compliance report and cascade it back through ITAM operations. You can't do it. That's why you need to have these multiple processes, deconstruct the problem and measure in real time then and do something about the problem in real time not 11 months down the line from a true up. That's fantastic. So we, we, we've looked at a lot of uh, content in, in the webinar today, um, and we've, we now understand that there, you know, there's a full process that you should engage as, a, as an organization on an ITAM uh, pro, uh, portfolio or, or ITAM, sorry, or ITAM project. Uh, so process is really important. Getting the buy-in of the, the senior executive is important understanding what you need to do in a step-by-step -step process is important. Tools, of course, are important because that helps reduce the, the amount of resource to, to deliver these licensed positions. But it process is just hyper, hyper important. Now, uh, Rory, thank you very much. And uh, you, as, as far as uh, Phil Merson and Rory is concerned, We've actually taken you all the way through our, our webinar and the content for our webinar. Uh, we're open for questions, and if there are any questions, please uh, please let us know. So, uh, Robin Scarlett, uh, any questions so far? Uh, no, it would appear our audience is, has gone a bit shy. Um, but thank you both for your amazing presentation. Really excellent points raised. Very informative. Um, sorry about. Oh no, we have just got a question. Um, so. Steve says that there's a lot of useful information being shared here. In our construction business, we have a real challenge and we are probably at level one maturity. Uh, we use MS System Center to manage, aka view at a point in time, our computer assets. This is, a fine, this is fine for those assets that are online. Are there any ideas uh, on what we can have as tags? Oh, tags, right. Uh... Rory, have you got any ideas? On, on tax, um, so yeah, again, ISO, ISO advocates um, the use of tags. Are you talking about physical tags or software tags? I think that's um, it's, it's a distinction worth qualifying there. Are you able to throw some light on that for us, Steve? Uh, he says physical. Right, so physical tags. Um, Asset and bar. Barcoding. Yeah. So, yeah, from an asset management perspective, uh, it, it's uh, the asset management tool that Avanti provide doesn't mind whether it's an IT asset, a mobile asset, a physical asset, so, or you could, you know, it could be any type of asset. I mean, we have medical assets, physical assets for uh, for your building industry and construction as well. So it doesn't matter. It could be a lorry. As long as you can identify that and have a unique identifier, you can manage it within the system. Now we have barcode scanning as well so if it's uh, multiple or high high volume uh, lift you know or coming into an organization you scan it and it can add it to that database 
So you could manage everything that you need to manage on a life cycle basis. Now, it's not just sort of managing it through the life cycle, it's managing it through its changes in the life cycle as well. So you might have uh, different locations that an asset might be based on. It could be different users who are using it or, or different users who are assigned to that asset. So, yeah, I mean, you, you can actually manage any type of physical device in, in asset management if that's what you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. This one, this, this webinar has been based around IT assets, mm -hmm. so IT hardware and software. But yeah, absolutely, Steve, it could be any type of asset. Just to qualify Phil's point there too, one, one thing to bear in mind, I appreciate you're as you say, level one, um, is the assignment of assets to individuals then at that point. So have an eye out for what your joiners, movers and leavers life cycle is actually like. So that if you're assigning assets to those individuals, you've also got an eye on the HR life cycle. So if they do move from site to site and they take their kit with them, you know then that there's a fair chance that the kit has actually moved from one site to another. Or indeed, if they leave, then at that point, you've got a list of equipment that you need to recover from that individual. Yes. You know, that's an important point. You're calling and onboarding, and in, in, actually, in Avanti's portfolio of products, uh, we actually have a full identity management portfolio, which actually does the onboarding and offboarding automatically and links it in with service management, which obviously links it in with IT asset management. So you get that full, uh, full site cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and onboarding and offboarding is become more and more important from a security perspective. Mm. Any more questions, Carla? Um, no, none's, none have appeared, um, but thank you both for today. Um, uh, again, apologies for some of the sound issues that we've had today. Um, if you missed anything, the webinar will be available to you uh, by Monday, and so will the slides. And I'm sure Rory or Phil won't mind if, um, if you contact them personally and if you have any questions. Absolutely, none at all. No problem, and, and thank you for your question, Steve. Excellent. Well, thank everyone for um, joining us today. I hope this webinar has been useful.